Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode two of Breaking the Mold, presented by the Tackle Talk podcast. This four-part series goes in-depth with some of the most creative, unique, and impactful lure designers in the fishing industry today. On today's episode, we talk jigs with the owner and designer of Beast Coast Fishing, Derek Carr. Episode two of Breaking the Mold starts right now. Hello, everybody. I'm Bill Dance, and you're listening to Tackle Talk. The Tackle Talk Podcast, brought to you by American Legacy Fishing and Outdoors, world-class fishing gear, unmatched personal service. Now, here's your host, Andrew Hayes. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Tackle Talk Podcast and episode two of Breaking the Mold. Before we get into today's episode, we have to give a big thank you to the folks that make this all possible, American Legacy Fishing and Outdoors. From our very first four-part series, The Bait Breakdown, all the way to this current series, Breaking the Mold, and everything that we've ever done in between, American Legacy Fishing has believed in this show and helped us continue to do what we do. But that is not the only reason you should check out American Legacy Fishing and Outdoors. You should check out American Legacy Fishing because they are every single thing that you guys listening to this have ever wanted in a fishing company. They have a great selection of high quality new and used gear. They have incredible customer service. They have fast shipping. They have a great price match guarantee. You find a better price somewhere else, message them. They will honor it. They run actual sales, not the same thing that you see at those other places where it seems like everybody conspires and has 5% off XYZ, you know, brand of rod or reels tomorrow, right? They do actual sales that no one else is doing. They have an elite program for $50 a year that gives you a huge list of benefits, including 10% back on all of your orders, basically a free, no questions asked, 10% back on everything, free shipping with no minimum. You want to buy a jerkbait? Buy a jerkbait. It gets sent to your door. They have discounts on used gear and trades that you get on top of their already great prices. You get access to the direct Megabass order process if you want to order something special through Megabass that might be hard to get. They have exclusive sales for elite members and a ton more. They also sell premium no-chip tungsten size stamped on the side, and they sell it cheaper than anybody else on the internet, even the sketchiest web sites that you can find from some, you know, Chinese factory somewhere that you've never heard of before. They sell them cheaper than that. And it's all from a small American owned Midwestern tackle company that's based out of Southern Indiana that takes care of their customers. So if that sounds like the company that you want to buy your fishing gear from, go over and check out AmericanLegacyFishing.com and see what all the buzz is about. And if that wasn't enough, we're going to save you 10% off your entire order. Some exclusions apply, but most of the stuff on that website, 10% off rods, reels, line, lures, apparel, everything. Just use code TACKLETALK10. Tackle Talk 10 at checkout, AmericanLegacyFishing.com. You need a new flipping rod. You need a new frog reel getting ready for, you know, summer coming up. You need to restock your jerk bait collection. Anything 10% off at AmericanLegacyFishing.com. Thank you to everybody over at American Legacy. Thank you to Graham, Brian, Adam, Tom, everybody that makes us continue to be able to do what we do and to be able to be unbiased on this show, to bring you the content that you want, and to give you great deals from a company that you can feel proud buying from. AmericanLegacyFishing.com. Use code TackleTalk10. All right, folks, so let's get to episode two of our big project, Breaking the Mold. So again, the entire goal here was to find four people that are pushing the envelope in four different segments of the lure market. So that was Soft Plastics with Big O from Rage Tail. That's our guest today talking about jigs with Derek Carr from Beast Coast Fishing. That's Hard Baits with Ot Defo, the lure designer for the OG series over at Rapala. And it's Lure Scent with Mark Sexton from Berkeley and Max Scent. So if you missed episode one, go back and check out our episode with Steve Parks, the inventor of Rage Tail Lures, the Rage Crawl, the Rage Menace, all those staples. It was a really cool episode because we got in to the technical side of designing soft plastics, of getting that motion just right, and all of the kind of insight into his thought process. He's a very technical guy, has an engineering background. It was really cool to hear his kind of take on designing the lures of what was important to him, of, you know, the angles and getting the motion of the flap 
rate and all that kind of stuff just right. Super cool episode. So go check that out. And today we have Derek Carr from Beast Coast Fishing specifically to talk about jigs. And if you've ever seen a Beast Coast jig, you will understand why Derek is our guest today. And if you haven't seen a Beast Coast jig, go over to Instagram and search Beast Coast Fishing. They're sleek, they're modern, they're innovative, they're trendy, they're using materials like no-chip tungsten, they're incorporating different skirt material and head designs, really cool jigs. Now, the interesting part of this episode that I think kind of throws a wrench in things is that there's only so much innovating that you can do with a jig. It's a head, it's a skirt, it's a hook, it's a weed guard, so that's a different aspect of this conversation that we get into versus the other three in this series. I think Derek probably has the toughest area to innovate in because you're so constricted by the box that is jigs and the limitations of the simplicity of a jig. But with that in mind, when you see a Beast Coast jig, you can tell it's a Beast Coast jig, and that's why I wanted to talk to Derek, the perfect guy to have this conversation with. So when I think of new, sleek, cutting-edge trends in the jig market, I think Beast Coast. So with that in mind, we're going to get right into this. Here is our conversation with Derek Carr from Beast Coast Fishing. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are joined today by Derek Carr, owner of Beast Coast Fishing. Derek, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, of course, man. Appreciate you having me on. So I know we talked about a little bit before we started recording. The whole purpose of this kind of mini series here, it's called Breaking the Mold, and it's talking with lure designers that are kind of consistently pushing the envelope in your specific lane. So today I want to talk about jigs with you and hats off to Beast Coast because I think, at least when I think of who's at the forefront of jig design and who's trendy and who's new and who is is you know, as corny as it sounds, breaking the mold in terms of what jigs are out there on the market. I think you guys do a great job from the design to the, you know, the photography to the marketing. You guys do a great job. So hats off to you. Um, from what I know about you and your background, I think you're, you're kind of traditional Northeast angler, bass background. You did some saltwater, I think, uh, early on I was reading. And then at some point you did what we all wish we could do, which is kind of, you know, uh, <laughs> go off on your own, leave your your big company job and start your own tackle company. So I yeah. want to start there. Let's back up to when you took that leap from a traditional job to a tackle company. When did you first start dipping your toes in building baits or building lures in general? Maybe not necessarily designing, but just making your own baits. Yeah, well, so I think, so, I mean, like, obviously all of us have, have tinkered at some point and, you know, I've done that my whole life. And I also, I think like a lot of us, well, many of us, I, at least I, you know, had some exposure to the retail end when I was younger. So I kind of saw how marketing worked in the industry and what was available and what was being done. And, you know, then fast forward to, you know, I had a job as kind of like a, I mean, my, my title, you know, I worked on a brand team for, for, you know, a huge vitamin company. And it, it was an interesting experience to put it politely. Um, and after a couple of years, I was just like, you know, look, like I, I like the fishing industry. At least I, you know, I like it a little less now, <laughs> but that's because <laughs> I know how hard it is. And, and that's just being open and honest. And, uh, I, you know, I, I do still love it and I love the customers and that's like the most important thing. Um, you know, like the anglers are what it's all about. And, and that's actually something I'm sure we'll talk about later, but, um, yeah. So, you know, like after a couple of years of, of, you know, the traditional grind and, you know, watching how people's lives evolved within, the corporation that I worked for, I was just like, Oh my gosh, like, you know, this is, this is not what I want. Like I'm not necessarily in love with, you know, the flow of life as it is. Like I can't imagine, you know, 10 years from now when I've, you know, quote unquote, you know, you meet, make VP or, or whatever your, your goal is in your career. And it's like, I think a lot of times you just have to like take a step back and be like, do I really want this or should I try something else? And, and so I obviously decided to try something else. And um, so while I was working there, I um, kind of, you know, started, there was a number of things that I've been tweaking with and I kind of been watching what was going on with the industry and I didn't have a lot of money to start. It basically was, was bootstrapped by, you know, what I had earned and saved with my wife. And um, you know, so a big chunk of that went, right into this. And I just decided, you know, look, I'm 30. It's time to like, you know, do it or don't. And, uh, you know, so fortunately my wife was in a position to 
keep us afloat if I were to sink. And believe me, it's been, I think like people think this is, you know, a, a, a you know, multi-million dollar brand and, you know, there's several employees and, you know, five years later, we subcontract like everything out and it's really just three, I mean, technically two and a half. And so it's like, it's way harder than I think I initially thought it was going to be. And that's for probably a number of reasons that aren't really like exciting to talk about, like cash flow, like, you know, how long, you know, like, like basically like balancing lead times with revenue and just so many things that you don't really think about when you're excited to start something new. And that's coming for me. Like I, for, I did this for a living. Like I worked on P and L's and I mean, just boring, obnoxious financial stuff is what I did a lot of the time. And like, I still let myself like be naive and be like, okay, X number of units. Like I want to do some cool stuff. And, you know, and, and, and it honestly, like the first year or two, I mean, it was always positive, like to be like sales have always, you know, doubled every single year. So it's, and, and I honestly, this is the tip of the iceberg five years later, which I'm excited about, but so, yeah, like I basically, you know, was 30 and, I knew I was in a position that I probably wasn't going to be in much longer to like really start from scratch. Um, cause I would never be able to do it again now. And that's not to be a downer because a lot of people are in different positions than I am, but I have a daughter, my wife and I both work. It's, you know, it, it's, that was the time and you either do it or you don't like, it's just that simple. And I know that sounds like a cop out, but it's really not. I mean, it's just, it's a decision, right? Like you just say to yourself, okay, well, I'm going to do it or I'm not going to do it. And here's what I'm going to do and why I'm going to do it. And here's how long it's going to take. And you try and plan it out. And more than likely it's not anywhere near that plan, but you got, you, you go with it. And if the momentum is right, then you just keep going. So that's kind of like, that's kind of where I am. Um, I just always was hardcore into angling and, I had a background I thought that crossed over well into kind of doing my own thing in a space that I wanted to do it and, you know, make good stuff. That's also important. And it sounds really cheesy, but like, I always just, I always wanted to make things like that's what always turned me off about like, I don't know, finance or whatever, working for somebody else, different industry. Like I always, I love the idea of like making and marketing a product. Like I, I just, I want to make things that, that people like. And, and, you know, if it's in a space like this where I know, what makes a good product for the most part. Um, or I have people in my circle that can guide me to that, which is something I'm sure we'll talk about later. You know, that's, 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 that's kind of like how it all came together. So. So first off, kudos to you too, because the one thing that I respect the hell out of is that you did bootstrap this company. And I think there's a big difference. And I think a lot of times you'll see the trajectory of a business reflect that, right? Somebody that got some really big initial venture capital money versus someone that started from the ground up and grew this thing the right way. And there's there's a lot of, of I think, value to be said of what we would love something to just blow up out of nowhere, but there's yeah. a lot of value to something incrementally growing and you grow this steady audience and this loyal audience versus kind of shot out of a cannon because you threw money at it or because something went viral or whatever. You get a lot more, I think, of a... Um, a well-rounded, sustainable company by growing incrementally and bootstrapping. So kudos to you. We've kind of done the same thing with this show, right? I've been doing this out of my spare bedroom for three years with, you know, $100 worth of microphone equipment. And and you do, right? And it takes a while. You hinted at the fact that a lot of this doesn't happen overnight. And you have to power through because what people don't do is they don't power through that hard first year. They start something. They think it's going to go gangbusters. There's six months worth of just, like, you know, with this show, right? The first six months, nobody's listening. And probably the first, you know, you might have had an initial uh, boom when you launch, but then it's, you know, it takes some time to grow a, a customer base. But the other side of that is that you mentioned that you're not a million dollar company. You present yourself as a million dollar company. And I, I sincerely mean that, right? With from what folks can see, and that's the cool part about now, I think today's day and age is everybody's sort of on an even playing field with social media. Everybody has access to an Instagram account, to a Facebook page, to YouTube, and you do a very good job on that front. When you look at your photography, your marketing, how you present yourself, I think that makes a big difference too because you do present yourself as a company that probably has 50 people working for it and you know is yeah, I know that's not the case, but you know, to an outsider, you do a very you do better than some companies that do have those 50 people working for them. So kudos on that front too. Well, th thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. And yeah, like, you know, like you said, and that's like a whole separate conversation. Like, you know, yeah, you've got, 
there's, there's always like now that, so, you know, this year we, you know, I'd love to get close to that, that number. And I think, you know, it's, it's going to happen, which is, I, I feel it's crazy to say it because it just, I just, you know, don't want to jinx anything. Five right. <laughs> into it. I'll knock on wood for you. Yeah. 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 Me too. No, but it's like, you know, that's what I was saying, you know, where I felt like I had a background to the point where I'm not an expert in like a lot of things, but I was pretty good at most of what I needed to give the thing a good shot, you know, and, and present it as such. And, you know, like, just like you said, with social media, you know, you can kind of all of a sudden have conversations with your consumers, which is unbelievable. And guess what? A big brand can never beat you with that because they're controlled by VPs and boards and shareholders and stakeholders who are like, oh, no, you can't say that online or, you know, no, be careful presenting yourself in that way. No, like I just, you know, it's me or Noah on, on, you know, the social channel. And it's just like, you know, primarily it's Instagram and Facebook. And we were this year, I'm going to actually invest in YouTube. So I'm really excited about that, but that's neither here nor there. Um, <clears throat> like just to your point, social, the truthfully, it's really just like Instagram, which is funny because I'm so the guy that's like, I don't want my daughter on Instagram. Like I don't want to be on Instagram. I don't even use it personally, but I love, I love like, you know, sharing the brand through Instagram and talking to customers and, you know, like answering messages, even though I, I know, and I apologize, it takes forever to get a response sometimes in the messages, but it's, it just is what it is. And, but I enjoy doing that. And it's really become like, you know, not only has it become super powerful from a, like a marketing perspective, but like, you know, the, the formal term aside, like it's awesome to talk to people, you know, when you also get a good gauge on things, which you, you know, you don't necessarily have numbers to look at and review and, and forecast from. So you kind of like start to use social media as a really good barometer for a whole lot of shit. <laughs> Can you imagine how much companies 40, 50 years ago would have paid to have a platform where your customers could organically share their experience with your company and basically do your marketing almost for you, right? They would have, it's, it's invaluable. And I think it's a lot of times we take that for granted. Yeah. Yeah. And like, yeah, you no, know, truthfully it is. And, you know, the only thing with social is like, you can't help, you know, it's very hard, especially in this industry where it's like super small and like every, it's, it's much smaller than people think. And it's like, you can't help but be sucked into conversations and topics and, you know, people that maybe you need to, uh, you know, you don't necessarily want to be in the spotlight. I guess is the best way to put it. Or, you know, it's just a, it's kind of a weird deal. Like, right. You're, you're living as a brand like on social media, but it's really just people talking to people. And so it becomes, it's, it's a challenge in its own way, I guess is what I'm saying. And that's something I, I just never could have told you that like would have happened. And, and it has happened because we've all of a sudden gotten like a great little loyal following. So well, and one of the reasons I think that happened is is honestly what we're going to talk about today, which is from the design side, right? You're pushing yeah. the envelope. You actually have a unique set of products versus, I've said it on the show before, and you know, there's nothing wrong with folks that do this, but there's a big difference between someone that is going to innovate and is going to, in your case, like in jigs, for instance, which is what we're going to talk about today, there's a big difference between somebody who is going to take the time, think of something, draw it, cat it, mold it you know, and, and make a product versus someone that's going to go online to Barlow's or to, you know, lurecraft.net yeah. or whatever and buy a mass produced mold and make them themselves and sell them. There's, it's just two different stratospheres in terms of a tackle company. So I think that's where obviously a, a lot of folks gravitate to you is because you can tell right off the bat when you look at your products, they're not mass produced. They're not mass molds. You're making these yourself and you're trying to push the envelope a little yeah. bit. Yeah, no. And like you said, there's no, um, you know, believe me, there's some builders that make just phenomenal products. Like, just like you said, like there's nothing wrong with it, but from a business, like, look, the reality is that there's also like a huge piece of the market that's always going to, and it's bigger than people think maybe it's not, but, but it's big. Like people, there's people that are always going to buy from like the bait makers and those guys make awesome stuff. And, and like, that's, that's cool. I, I just knew that you know, to try and really, to try and like build like something that lasts, you know, like, and I don't know if it's going to get there or not, but like to try, 
I just knew I like had to do something different. And, and then obviously like from a product perspective, like, and this is kind of a segue into another question I know you're going to ask me about, but like, if you don't change, especially with jigs and plastics, right? I mean, the, every segment within the whole category is old as dirt, right? It's like, it's a hundred years old. And so, and technology can only advance so much when you have to make something fake to fool a bass. So, and believe me, there's some phenomenal technology out there that I'm sure is going to come. And I'm always trying to think of stuff, but I think, you know, my point. And so, yeah, I was just like, look, I got to like make something good and unique so that people and retailers recognize that. And, you know, obviously most importantly, they should be functionally different and better. So, and, and I'm not saying every product is, I'm sure there's a lot of people that don't like a lot of stuff that, you know, Beast Coast makes, which is cool. Like I respect that. And, um, you know, but for the product line we have, and by the way, there are so many phenomenal jig makers out there, big, small, medium, like, you know, I, I, I feel silly even like having this discussion because I hate feeling like there's any like positive praise, whatever. I'm sure it's like a problem with me, but, but anyways, like there's people that make stuff, you know, I'm sure in some cases even better than my stuff to certain people. So I'll put that out there, but yeah. So that's kind of like, you just, you just sit down and you realize like, you, you know, if you, I'm trying to build a brand that people recognize and like for a reason that maybe they don't even understand. And I thought part of that was always like, let's just make cool, good products that are like visually different, like you said, and, and people apparently picked up on it, which is cool, <laughs> but it's very different. You hit at what I think is probably the toughest part of especially jigs, but I mean, fishing tackle and products in general is that you're right. Everything's old as dirt. Everything's been done. There's only so many ways you can make a piece of plastic look like a crawdad. There's only so many ways you can make a jig. A jig only has so many components, lead on the head, a hook, a skirt, a keeper, right? There's, there's not yeah. much that you can tinker with there. And very rarely is there time where something comes along. I mean, I can only think of maybe one or two times in the past 15, 20 years that something has come on the market where you're like, whoa, that's different. That's not like, like a chatterbait, like something like that, right? Where there's a bladed jig and it's like, whoa, that's, that's at least a different take on something that we've seen before. It's been a while since something like the bladed yeah. jig came along. I'm actually right. like really excited. I'm always thinking about it, but then I get to a point where I'm like, I don't have the money to work with the pros that I need to work with to make this thing a commercial success. And that's actually, that's one of the reasons that the industry bothers me because so many people are listening to like people that are kind of just regurgitating what the brand that made the product wants them to say. And like, I honestly think the best stuff comes from the ground up. Like I've got buddies that are absolute like hammers, like way better anglers than me. And like you listen to these people and like, you know, you know, surprise, surprise, like they've all been asking for something similar and boom, everybody likes it. And you make a good point there too, which is, I think people more and more by the year, like as, as more of us are doing this, where like everybody has an audience now, everybody has access to reach people. I think people are starting to see through disingenuousness, if that's a word, right? If it, the yeah. fact that people can see, oh, pro angler X that has cashed two checks in 30 years has, is, you know, pimping out this product because he's getting paid, you know, $4,000 a year to, to, pimp out this product, right? That doesn't hold nearly as much weight as my local hammer saying that this swim bait is absolutely murking them on the river, right? That they're just in different stratospheres. And 30 years ago, that was not the case. People bought something because a Kevin Van Dam, a Rick Klun, a somebody was using something and they were on TV saying, hey, you need to be throwing this. I just think that doesn't hold, I think by the year that's holding less and less weight. Totally. And look, I love like when it's, and like, I think the, the, the most important thing you said is and this is a strategy that like, again, I'm like, like you we talked about this earlier. Like if you start with a bunch of money behind you and a product line and distribution, you can pretty much kind of like force a product down people's throats and you're going to gain some traction. And like, I don't mean to sound like an ass, like I'm not trying to sound like ignorant, but that is like how it, and it happens a lot of times, but Oh, and and, and to, to bring it into your, your point about social, people are seeing through that now and they like want the proof. And so like, if you don't have that proof, 
like it weighs less. And honestly, like that's something I struggle with all the time. Cause like we, we currently work with literally one elite series angler and it, it's like, I, I know that guys on the, like a lot, of, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to mention who here, but there's a lot of guys that use our products, you know, and it's just like, you know, they've got deals in place and it's all cool. I respect it. I totally respect it. I get it. It's just like, that gets frustrating to see, you know what I mean? And, but look, Hey, it is what it is. And, uh, you know, our times, our times is, is coming every year. So, <laughs> well, the transparency is, uh, is, much easier to see now. So like you'll see, I'm, I follow, you know, the tournament series and they'll do those photos where at the beginning, you know, they'll, they'll hold up the lure they're going to be throwing that day, but you know, Bassmaster live or MLF live doesn't lie, right? You can go to the way and you can say, yeah, I caught all these on a strike King hack attack mm-hmm. jig. And then it's like, Oh, that's weird. Cause on bass live, I saw you throwing, you know, a beast coast hybrid jig. I, I can, we can see that. Right. So that's the, that's the interesting part of all of this. Yeah. Our little magnet. We have a jig called a little magnum, which is definitely, I'm sure one that that's a good one to talk about from like a product standpoint. Cause, but anyways, uh, yeah, like that product, I, I, I know, you know, there's probably like, I don't know, quite, quite a few, probably like seven or eight or nine or 10 guys like on the elites that, that use them, which is cool. And, uh, but yeah, I just wish they'd talk about it more. Yeah. <laughs> I, get, I get it. All right. We'll get back to our conversation with Derek in just a second, but first a quick message from Arctic coolers. So you've probably heard of Arctic, it's spelled R-T-I-C, all capital letters, the big cooler company that's out there that's actually giving you cool outdoor coolers that don't cost $10,000, right? I know we all know the brands that we're talking about here where you get this you know, cooler that's the size that can fit in your kayak and it's $550. Why is that cooler $550 when there's something out there that will do the exact same thing for a fraction of the price? That's where Arctic comes in. So if you go over to the Arctic website, you will see they have everything from hard coolers to soft coolers to you know travel mugs and cups and bottles basically anything out there to keep your stuff hot or cold they're insane the ice retention the performance the durability of arctic is second to none i love my arctic cooler i have one of the 20 quart hard coolers and then i have this 36 ounce bottle with a big wide mouth on it too so that cooler in of itself is a beast it's tiny it'll fit in a kayak but it will keep ice for days it's nuts it's just as good, if not better, than anything else out there on the market. The temperature retention, first class because it has that foam-insulated wall, plus the cool lift design feature makes worrying about your ice melting a thing of the past. It has heavy-duty protection with that combination of the durable rubber T-latches and the molded tie-down slots so you can keep your food or beverages all secure, and then its roto-molded construction makes this cooler tough enough to handle any and every excursion. So the folks at Arctic get it. When it comes to being out there with your friends or your family, your fishing buddies, your hunting partners, Party, you want to keep going and they offer the right gear at the right price so you can be in the right state of mind while you're out there happy the fun only ends if you let it so let them help you make it last over at www.rticoutdoors.com that's www.rticoutdoors.com all right let's get back to our conversation with Derek Carr so let's get into the nitty gritty here. Let's dive into the design itself. So the first question I want to ask you, and this is, I know it's an open question. It's a cliche question, but I wanted to kind of sort of, sort of start off the conversation here yeah. when you, and I'm sure you've been asked this a trillion times. It's one of those questions I'm sure you get at every trade show you've ever been to the first person you talk to, but in your mind, what makes a beast coast jig different or special versus what's out there on the market like to you when you're putting this out there what's the selling point or what's the thing you hang your hat on where you're like yes this is this is kind of the staple or the mark of our jigs you know that's a tough question i think like in every effort i i really try and like create a good value for consumers with like what you get um and i know that sounds really generic but like i want to put out like a phenomenal product at a price point that is, you know, like achievable, like within our tungsten lineup, I think, you know, I think there's a really good price point there and like, you know, our made in the US, we we try and stay competitive and provide like a phenomenal product. Like, you know, there's other companies out there that do it. Um, But yeah. And I think like, 
I think mostly it's just for the most part, if you look at our football jig, although we've got a new football jig, which is going to be our final jig before we really start going in other places, that new football jig is coming in, in June or July. But, but for the most part, you look at our items and you can see like a visual difference that kind of like, you know, you, you look at it and you're like, huh, like I kind of see why they did it that way. And I think that's like within jigs, like, like look at our battle flip jig with the double wide weed guard, like, and the big five Oh short shank Amikatsu. Like we, like there's a, there's probably like 50 jigs out there with a similar head shape, but the hook is different and the weed guard is different. And those two things make it a completely different product for a completely different purpose. And so, yeah, like I would say it's just kind of like, just, just being a little different and kind of like being in like a niche within the jig category, which is huge. That is just a little different from the product that's closest to it. If that makes sense. Um, yeah. It's just a style, a kind of a style thing too, you know, for again, another generic thing, but it's very much like, um, the way I look at your jigs and the way I look at a lot of your products, is almost like a car where you can tell like driving down the road, what, what, make that car is just by the body style and by you know the headlights and things like that the same thing with with your oh, jig awesome. i can look at a jig that. without a package and be like at least if it's not you but it's close it's like it reminds me of a beast coast jig that's that's what i think yeah. of you yeah, know there's a lot of good a lot of good jig companies out there and that's why it's just like so hard to it's so hard to kind of be like well we should you know i should do this because you know and, and then like you know because there's a lot of people it's like a jig's a jig i obviously don't feel that way um, right <laughs> you feel that way but uh but yeah it's it's tough because sometimes you know you get close to something it's like i just there's too many things like it and it's it's hard so it's a challenging part of it but so when you sit down to create a jig or to create a new line of jigs or to branch out what are the top maybe two or three things that you as a designer consider when it comes to a jig like i'm assuming it's yeah. like you could do fall rate cover deflection that kind of stuff but where do you start in terms of like the couple things that I need to, to consider right off the bat before I go into the design process. Well, from a, from like a, so, so, so the thing that's not fun, but that I've had to learn to do better is to really think about things from like a business perspective first. And so like, I'm not like, I could come out with 15 more models of jigs and fill every space, but like, I, I just won't do that because like, I, you know, I really wanted to start with like a need and, and, you know, that kind of often comes from like conversations with like the guys we talked about, like your buddies that are, you know, respected and have connections where they can validate what they want with people that are fishing at some of the highest levels. You just like that. That's really, I think what it's got to, it's like that validation to do it before you start is kind of literally step one it's like is this a stupid thing to do like you know you know should we do this in you know one of four different materials and 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 so that's like kind of your part of your question is is like yeah like material so then like then it's like okay like what is it and why are we like are we going to spend the money to like go through the design process and build the molds and whatever and and then invest in the launch of the product and put yourself in a cash flow situation. Like it's, there's all kinds of things you got to think about when you're truly a small business. And uh, yeah. So like, you, you know, it's like that, that kind of validation. It's like, okay, this is, this is a need. Like I understand exactly why this is a need. And, you know, you go through the back and forth of, well, there's this product, like why, you know, anyway, so, so it's like that validation and then you immediately, it's like, okay, well, what material do you make it in? And, you know, that material discussion is like a whole separate discussion because even I have different opinions on, on, on the same material <laughs> based on like what you're doing with it. It's kind of complicated, but so then it's material. And then really it's like, like, it is like, like, okay, can we make it how we want to make it and not charge eight ninety nine, you know, for a jig? And, and, and that's like part of it where like certain things we actually will finish in house. Like one of the guys will literally like, like our sniper jigs, um, which is an awesome little smallmouth jig. It's, it's got no weed guard. We work with Travis at smallmouth crush and he won't mind that I said that I'm not trying to like plug him, but like that, that little jig 
you know, we actually um, hand finish those and do the packaging here at the shop. And so like certain, and you know, it's things get expensive unexpectedly. And so like, you kind of got to go through all that and be like, is it worth doing it? So sometimes like there's stuff I've wanted to do and it's like, I just, I don't know if it's going to be a success at this price point. And so it's like, that's really the process. That's, that's kind of like the first three steps before you get into the nitty gritty of actually like developing an item. So then once you decide, okay, I think this idea has enough legs to move through and you know, you have this, I'm sure you have a billion of those ideas and then eventually one of them, you have a little magnum or something like that where you're like, all right, let's go all in on this. Let's design this. Let's put it out. So where does, where does that process go from start to finish? Like I'm assuming it's idea, sketch, CAD, mold, test, like all those, but in your design process, what does that look like from start to finish? Honestly, that is exactly what the process is. It's, it's like, okay, you go through those first three steps and it's like, okay, now, you know, where am I going to have this thing made? Like, honestly, for like with tungsten, for example, there's, you know, like seven or eight factories that, that will do it. And there are two or three really good ones. And I think like Kaita, like there's a couple of companies that do it in-house, but nothing like you, like it is not feasible to do that in the United States. So, you know, you know, you have to go abroad and then it's like, okay, well, what's going to happen with shipping costs? And if we price the jig at, you know, the lowest possible price to where there's some margin in it for us and there's a great value for the consumer, like, are we going to screw ourselves if like what's happening, right? Like everything's getting expensive and everything's taking forever. So yeah, like you go through that whole process and, and then from a material perspective, like, you know, with tungsten, you can't make that here. Um, so stuff just kind of like shakes in a place and, um, you know, so you kind of pick your factory and you, you just start you start the design process, you know, like, I think there's very few, like I've got a background to where I can actually like pretty accurately and, and, uh, you know, kind of like dimensionally really sketch the, like the product from, from the beginning. Um, and I've got enough computer skills with, with a couple programs to where I can like get what I want pretty close. And then, you know, most professional factories here in the United States or abroad, like if they can't work with a 3D file, then you've got, you know, that's, you know, you, you like, so, so the, the point I'm making is, is, you know, you can kind of like hand off your work and make your production. And this is actually, I think, good advice, like, and some people won't like it, but like, even like make your production partner, your, your partner, right? Like you're working on a product together, like you know, you should really like be on the phone with them and be specific and, you know, let them understand exactly what you want. And it does help to have like a little artistic ability because it's very hard to describe, well, I want the radius this way, or I want these ribs to go like, you know, 30% deep here. And you know what I mean? So, you know, that, that helps me, but it's, it's something anybody should do is like really make whoever's going to make this thing for you, you know, unless you're really producing truly in-house, which, you know, kudos to you, but certain things you just can't. And so, you know, make your factory a partner, you know, or whoever's making your molds, whatever it is like, you know, if you don't have that skill, like, you know, fight and claw to get it as close as you can and then help, you know, let them do the work for you and, and, you know, just, just work with them as a partner and like, they'll love doing it. And I think like a lot of people don't do that, but. And you mentioned, so I think there's probably, and I don't know, you can tell me if I'm right or wrong, but this process looks two different ways, depending on whether it's lead or tungsten. If it's lead, you can do a lot of that here, right? You can make a mold here. You can pour that in the back and go, doot, 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 go back, pour your mold, test it, paint it, you know, go out and fish it where the opposite is true with tungsten, which you hinted at. And I think it's important for people to know, like if someone's making something out of tungsten, it is coming out of the same two, three, four factories in China. Nobody's doing that in their basement. Nobody's doing that in a warehouse no. somewhere. Those are all coming from overseas, which I'm sure probably ends up with issues with you in terms of at some point that has to get cast for the first time. What if it comes over here and what if it's just not what you were looking for or you have an yeah. issue with it? How does that process differ from lead to tungsten just in terms of you can make the CAD drawing, you can do all that, but then I'm sure that process looks different from there on out because you have so much less play with a tungsten product than you do with lead. Yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. Well, like I could literally, like, you know, you can build lead production molds for you know, a, literally not, not a lot of money. And whereas tungsten, 
I mean, when you commit to going to, you know, like a final production mold, you know, you're in it for, for a couple thousand and, and you better be 100% right about how the actual production is going to occur too, because tungsten, you don't just lay a hook in a mold with tungsten. It's, it's actually made completely, it's a completely different process. So yeah, like you need, well, it's a lot more nerve wracking, <laughs> I guess uh, is, is the first thing because there's more money and time on the line and potential for error. And it's just, it's a very different process and you just better be right. Um, and there's some other stuff with how tungsten is, is actually, you know, produced, um, that we won't go into, but it's just, it's not a fun material. It's just happens to be a really good material for certain applications. So, so yeah, like it's just, you know, one of the things you can do is actually make a lead sample first. I mean, that's what I was going to ask if you ever do that. Yeah. I mean, and yeah, we have, um, once, once, um, but yeah, like if you've got an item that you think you're going to lean in on and you just think it's, it's gotta be beautiful and perfect. Like why wouldn't you, you know, suffer a little bit more, spend a little bit more money, uh, be impatient a little bit longer and just know that it's at least visually going to be how you want it. Um, so, so yeah, so yeah, it's definitely a, a more of a pain in the ass. <laughs> yeah. And to add another wrinkle in this, so the industry and I think a lot of trends and stuff and, and everybody wants tungsten, right? I think you're seeing more and more stuff made out of tungsten, which is, you know, it's better feel, it's smaller, it's more compact. For me as a Midwest angler, for you as a Northeast angler, that's kind of the name of the game a lot of times is downsizing and making things more compact. That's just in our nature. Yeah, it's our but, situations, yeah, for sure. But then on the on the flip side, so it goes from lead to tungsten, painted tungsten, and then it goes from painted tungsten to this sort of no chip tungsten that everything's going to now. So what does the the difference look like on your end from, or is there any difference from designing a, you know, jig that's going to be tungsten, but painted to almost that perma matte material that you guys do? Yeah. So, so you've got lead, you've got, you know, bismuth, you've got tungsten resin or compound, which is basically actually a mix of, um, you know, like a derivation of tungsten raw material with, with some plastics, believe it or not. Um, but so there's really like five different, you know, materials and with tungsten, the problem with it was powder. It's so hard that powdering it is not as perfect a process as it is with lead, you know, which, which is a softer metal. And it's just, you know, depending on what kind of, what jig you buy from what brand, like some of these, you know, you can beat on them and they'll hold their powder coat. Like tungsten is not like that. And, you know, up until a couple of years ago, um, the technology didn't exist to where it wasn't just an incredibly reflective material. And like, you know, especially in clear water in the Northeast, it's like, you've got a little tiny football jig or a little tiny finesse jig. that's all matte with, you know, you know, it's black or whatever it is. And all of a sudden there's like sunlight glimmering off. It's just, so yeah, like that, that was a nice uh, change. And, but honestly, like we didn't develop that technology, um, but it's out there. And I think people just don't necessarily know about it, but there's really no reason that, you know, even like our, like within our terminal shop, like we sell weights as well, like under our gloss powder coats, because some people like flipping gloss weights. So underneath our gloss is still a perma matte finish. So there's not, there's no reflection. It's, it's, a, it's actually a raw material. It's not a finish. And that always bothers me when you see people that refer to it as a finish. Well, if it's a finish, then, then it's, then it's not. It can come off. Yeah. It's a, yeah. It's a, it's a yeah. raw material difference. Um, and yeah, that's the deal. It's, it's not a finish. It's actually the color of the material. So you can beat on the thing with a hammer and it'll kind of just patina instead of, show any shine um but yeah so that's just a specification though you know it's not really like a different production thing or it doesn't require um you know a different design really unless you're talking about tungsten versus tungsten compound which is a different material it's like basically only a little bit harder than lead like marginally um but it, well i should say dense um because it does have a different feel um but but anyways i, I digress <laughs> yeah 
And you hinted on a, a pain point, I think, for a lot of anglers, which is, oh, I'm going to pay $7, $6, you know, sometimes $8 for a tungsten jig, and it's going to be a football jig. What's a football jig made for? Dragging over chunk rock. And the first time I drag it over a chunk rock, you're telling me this thing went from black to, you know, silver. It's like, that's, I think it's why you're seeing, obviously, a lot of people move to that, you know, sort of uh, no chip material, and it, it just solves a lot of the issues. So there's a lot of guys, especially like, guys that fishing at, at higher like more than one of these guys has been like oh dude just raw raw lead like a lot of guys want just like a flat colorless head because with a lot of different jig you know certain jig bites it's it's just a re- more of a reaction thing you know so it's like if you don't need the color and some guys just whether it's superstition or there's some science in it i don't know but you know there's guys that just straight up like raw like bl- like just gray heads like unpainted heads you know what i mean like um so the perma mat is perfect for that because it's neutral it doesn't shine and it's just like the perfect just looks like a little stone <laughs> yeah um yeah that's that, that I, I i love the the idea of of just like that flat perma mat finish All right, we'll get back to our conversation with Derek in just a second, but first, a message from the boys over Dark Horse Tackle. You guys know Dark Horse, you know Jason and Josh, they're two good dudes live right here in Ohio that are trying to do something really cool in the subscription category and the fishing boxes. We all know there are a bunch of fishing boxes out there, they all kind of do the same thing, they give you cheap knockoff baits that, you know, either don't sell well in the stores or they're just off-brand here or there, they can get cheap, they can throw in these boxes. That's not what Dark Horse is doing. Dark Horse Tackle is trying to shine a light on those small independent American lure makers that are making really cool stuff that you might not know about in Iowa or in Kentucky or in Louisiana, in Washington. They're making great jigs. They're making great soft plastics. Uh, They're painting insane hard baits. All of this is happening right here in the United States from brands that you've never heard of until you subscribe to Dark Horse Tackle. So go over and check out www.darkhorsetackle.com. Click subscribe. There's a bunch of different options there. You can go as small as a dabble pack. You can go all the way up to a weekend warrior box. They have people's champ boxes every once in a while that are these super high quality boxes that have like, you know, custom glide baits and all kinds of stuff in them. It's nuts. All of that is available over at www.darkhorsetackle.com. All right, let's get back to our conversation with Derek. So another thing you hinted at earlier was that weed guard that you're talking about with that ellipse, you know, sort of weed guard that you guys have. And at some point you realize that, okay, that is something that's proprietary enough to protect. So at what point did, where did that design come from? The kind of, you know, ellipse design and when at, at some point did you say, holy moly, all right, we should probably go through, you know, either provisional patent or, you know, working patent on that because this is something we do want to protect. Yeah. So we actually used to work with a pro like five years ago that we don't work with any longer. And he actually kind of planted the idea of how do we do something different with the weed guard? And then, you know, the obvious response is, well, you don't want it to be too thick, but you want more coverage. So that's kind of like how that came to be. Um, But as far as protecting it, you know, like you said, I think the reality is getting like, it's tough to, to, to kind of bite that off, like to, to actually go through a patent process in this industry, because I mean, I got news for you. It still doesn't guarantee you anything. So I think your best bet is if you've got something, at least start the legal process that allows you to claim patent pending. And you're going to keep, I think a lot of the people that might quickly kind of, uh, you know, try and adapt it. But, you know, that patent pending status, I think is only good at truthfully, I need to either, I think like, <laughs> that brings up a different discussion, but um, it, it that patent pending status is not the same as obviously register patent, which I know, you know, and, and, and yeah. I'm sure most people know, but, but yeah, it's just a step you can take. But the reality is like, from my perspective, again, because I don't have any like brand new industry changing technology that's backed by a million dollars, you know? So for, for anybody that's considering the patent approach, like I think that they, not that I, I, I don't even feel qualified to necessarily give sound advice, but I do think this is sound advice and it's, you better be sure that financially you're going to be able to go through the patent process because it's not cheap. And, you know, by the way, this industry, 
it's way harder to break into, I think, than a lot of people think. So you better have like your distribution in place because, you know, you get a patent, you better sell the thing and it better make people happy and catch fish because you got to sell a lot of units of product in this industry. Like to, to, I mean, you can do the math. <laughs> There's not a lot of money in, in, in a $5 item. Um, but anyway, that's kind of like a, that's a whole different thing, but, uh, but yeah, so, so, so like just the patent idea is, is, it applies, you know, and a lot of guys have patents in the industry and it's awesome. But as a small business, I just think you need to be extra careful that you've really got something that you think is going to be commercially successful and like fly under the radar enough to where the big guys don't just take it from you immediately. And then what are you going to do? Turn around and sue them? Like with what money that you have <laughs> because you just build a new item? <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? It just it becomes a real thing that you need to consider as a small business is, is what I'm yeah. really saying. You know, if I were a big business, like, yeah, I'd go for as many patents as, as I could. But, you know, I just tried to, well, I am, I'm, I'm trademarking the show's name. And I thought that was bad enough to go through the trademark process. And I know the patent process is like 10,000 times above trademark process. Oh, yeah. And that, that made my brain spin. So hats off to you. So the, the ellipsy kind of we guard there in general, the thought process on that is that it's thinner. So you don't lose hook penetration, but you still get the kind of, you know, protection from yeah, wood and cover and stuff. Easy. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's honestly really good for reeds and wood. And that's what um, the, the, the pro that we, we kind of like worked with on that item initially, like that's really where it came from. Um, and yeah, like when you have a wider weed guard, that's not as deep as it is wide, you know, it's an ellipse. It's uh, you know, it's really good in situations where like, like heavy situations where the weed guard deflects left or right. And you're going to hang up. Like when you're flipping like, lay downs that are like really tangled stuff or you know like high stem count stuff like like reeds and stuff like that like so in situations like that like it's it's a heavy duty jig you got to be be rigged and ready with the right equipment to, to, to properly kind of fish it but yeah it's got a good following because you know if you're fishing wood and flipping like a lot of wood um, or reeds and stuff like that or current situations where it might push it up under like lay downs and stuff or whatever it is, banks and bushes and stuff, you know, it's, it's a really hard jig to hang up. Um, and that was the, the point of it. Um, but yeah, like if, you know, you fish that jig with 12 pound fluoro, like you won't get a good hook set, but if you go out with the right deal, you know, it's, it's an awesome, it's like unbeatable in certain situations. And that's what it's all about. Like I, like kind of like earlier, it's like, I don't, I don't even have a plain lead, like, you know, cross eye vertical eye casting jig because everybody does like i i just you know what i mean um but but so yeah like that's the deal with that that battle flip item um, okay so there's two more jigs specifically i want to ask you about um the first one you actually have gone down the road of not just silicone skirts you've gone down the road of uh hair as well so your little uh hustler jig, hustler. Your, your hybrid hustler so yeah. at what point did you guys decide that hey i want to start incorporating hair in there and, and I know you, you touched on a lot of these are situational jigs. What situation did you make that for? Well, really like spring. I mean, people use it all around. On top. I mean, it's a jig, right? And, and, but, but it seems like in the cold water, like, you know, a lot of times the marabou is not necessarily even super visible like you or me, but the fish, you know, in clear water, especially the smallmouth, you know, it gives it a different look because it just kind of fills out the bottom of the skirt differently. And, but you know, like it's, it's really just a, I fish it pretty much only in spring um, and fall, but that's just me. I mean, people do things <laughs> that they want to do, but yeah, that was really the deal. It's like, how do we kind of create a heavy duty? Cause we have mixed bag lakes, you know, up here and catch big, 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 of both species. So, you know, we, I just wanted a hook in it that that was like, not a one Oh or a two Oh light wire hook, which you see in like a traditional marabou jig. And there's a couple little kind of like finesse jigs that have some hair in them, which are beautiful products, but you got to fish them on like, you know, six to, you know, maybe 12, but most likely eight to 10 fluoro. And so this was like a little heavier duty than that, like just to pitch around like up here in the North. And, and that's, you know, became a thing where, you know, you flip it around and you put a little swim bait on the back, like a little Kai tech. And that's why we put a screw lock in that one specifically, because, you know, it locks these little super salty trailers, like the little Kai tech 2.0 or something like that. It just locks them on really well. And, you know, you can just kind of, you can basically flip that 
like into wood and rock where like if you toss that you can't throw a hair jig you know you can't throw a jerk bait and like a big jig early in the season especially like up here around smallmouth some guys i'm sure flip a big jig and kill them but a lot of guys most guys don't and and so this was kind of like that in between where it's like it's got some hair it's like super finesse but it's got a heavy enough hook to where you can still you know you can work it around some structure and still set the hook you know nicely with casting gear uh, if that's your thing um so that was kind of like where that came in is you know catching those fish around like wood and structure you know maybe when they're moving in like kind of pre-spawn basically uh, and then in the fall when when you know there's like a push-up shallow and they get around <clears throat> excuse me they get around stuff again but uh yeah so that's kind of like how that came to be is like how do we make a finesse jig better and and like kind of like more specific and and that's that's where that came from so speaking of you know little finesse jigs that have some cojones behind them the last one i wanted to ask about is the little magnum and i think first off kudos to you guys on the the name the marketing the everything on that's just fantastic it's a plus oh, but it's a it's a very <laughs> serious jig too this thing's you know uh one of the cooler jigs i think i've seen come out in recent memory so where where did the need for that come from and again what situation did you envision when you said all right let's go to work on this sort of tungsten finesse jig that's going to fill a niche that we haven't filled yet yeah. So like a lot of guys up here will throw these. So I have a buddy, Mike, and, you know, honestly, he and, and one or two other guys had, had kind of planted the seed about, you know, like we want this little kind of shape, this little like teardrop kind of super weight forward shape, which falls fast. And it's, and it let, you know, you can do a lot with it. You can swim it, you can drag it. It's, it's a casting kind of, it's, it's kind of like a casting head shape. Basically it's, it's, you look at the, the product, but there wasn't really any that had, you know, that were made with tungsten or tungsten compound or any lead free material, which, you know, in our region is important, but, but you want a fast fall with it. And there was nothing that had a hook, like a good hook. Like there was literally nothing that had like a good, like really strong, but, but compact hook. Um, and so that's kind of like how the idea came to be. It was basically planted in my brain. <laughs> like we talked about, like, listen to people. And, um, you know, that's, that's kind of like where it came from. And it's like, you, you know, need this because you can't, you got to be able to flip lay downs and stuff like that, especially in like late spring or well, I should say like late pre-spawn when they're, every fish is shallow and, you know, you, you can catch them good on jigs, but there was nothing that had like, like, you know, good fast fall, especially for, you know, more important in the summer. Um, but that was tungsten. So it was super small and you keep it really compact because, you know, you catch a lot of small mouth doing, doing that. Um, and sometimes, frankly, you just want that little compact profile, just like I'm more comfortable with that. And so that's, that's kind of like where it came from. It's like, we gotta, we gotta do these things. It needs a weed guard. That's like actually sufficient. It needs a big hook that's short. And, you know, you got to make some good colors and it's got to be lead free and, and wait forward. And like, so all those things came together and that's how the little Magnum was born. You know, we've got a custom hook assembly in it. So it's got a teeny tiny little line tie. So it basically like you're not just melts into the jig. So it doesn't catch grass. Like it's really, really weedless. Like it's an awesome jig around grass and stuff. Um, but but yeah, and then we made the design totally weight forward by using that double barb weed guard. And that's actually a really important feature there because, you know, to get a fast fall, you just put everything in one place. Like all these jigs have material along, you know, in some cases, almost an inch along the, 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 the shank of the hook. Um, and, and that's, you know, that makes it want to fall more horizontally, whereas we've got the densest material that you can work with tungsten and every bit of it is right in the head in like a little torpedo teardrop shape. And, and so, yeah, it flies down and you can even use, like you can use a chigger crawl or some of these baits that are awesome, but you know, usually you need to like really get them going to flap our little three a sounds, little magnum will get those things, any claws to kick on the way down. So that was another thing. So yeah, it's just like a little home run jig and I'm not, being a self promoter because I don't like to do that, but this thing is, um, it, it's awesome. And, and yeah, it kind of like solves a lot of little problems that a lot of guys kind of had up here. 
situation. And and there are three specific parts of that jig I wanted to ask you about. The first one you kind of hinted at, which is the the wire keeper yeah. itself or the bait keeper, because and and that's interesting. I think you answered it right. I was going to ask why you stray away from you know in that situation a screw lock versus a yeah. double point hook, and and so it's because of fall rate. It sounds like. Well, honestly, no. The only other feasible, the only other option. So yeah, like if we were to put material along the hook, like you know, like which is traditionally done. And it's totally fine in most cases, to be honest, you know, to, as, as part of the keeper, you run the material up the hook and, uh, but you know, we, you know, you got to keep all the material in the head. So what do you use as a keeper? Because, you know, that's, you know, so you basically come down to a screw lock and wire and one wire I didn't think would be enough. So I wanted to do wire on, you know, both sides of the hook. And it's actually like a totally custom wire form. That's not two wires. It's one formed assembly that runs around the hook another pain in the ass tungsten thing. <laughs> but <laughs> um, worth it in the end. Yeah. Yeah. But, but so we didn't do screw lock because uh, you can't use Z-Man on a screw lock. Um, right. That's the tough part about screw locks. Yeah. So that's why in this case, you know, a lot of guys up here do like that, that, that material, um, you know, and it's durable guys all over like it because it's durable. Um, but so yeah, that, that's, I, I would have put a screw lock in it, but um, you know, the double barbs actually turned out to be like really, really, really perfect for it. So the next was the fact, and this jig has it, and I want to ask your opinion on this because you don't see a lot of people do both. You you see a lot of people either wire tie or band tie, and you're doing both on a jig like this. Is it is it just a durability play or is it just a finish play so you don't have that yeah. that no, wire exposed? It's it's well, it's both. It's it's like, you, it, well, no. Truthfully, what it is is there's times where when you see, if you tie with wire, now thread is an option, but threads kind of, and we use thread in our sniper jig, but it, it's got its, you know, it's, it's thread. So it's prone to tearing and, and abrading and things like that. But wire, when it's turned real tight, like I've literally broken wire tied jigs, like at that wire point where it's twisted and that just, it's metal, right. And it's cinched down and, you know, maybe we can specify different metal, but it will happen over time. So it's like, why, like, why wouldn't we just reinforce it with a band, you know, because our skirts still flare out really hard um, because the hubs aren't too big to hold the little band. So they like push up against them and flare really hard and we use good material on our skirts. But so, yeah, like that's, you know, it's like why, especially with tungsten where again, like our labor, we were able to do that, you know, honestly, like I couldn't do that in the U S because it would make the jig cost $10 if we banded it and wire tied it. And like, that's, you know, maybe not 10, maybe like seven ninety nine. but I, I wouldn't pay seven ninety nine for even a phenomenal, beautifully made product, you know, like that's in the lead jigs. I just, so anyways, I wanted to keep it down. And, and so that's why with all of our tungsten stuff, we do it because we can afford to just barely, um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's functional and, and, you know, it's peace of mind and there's, you know, nobody else that really does it. So, you know, why not? Last question on that jig hook choice. And so this hook is a, I think it's a BKK hook, right? Yeah. So I, most people listening to this, I'm assuming there are a lot of people that aren't familiar with BKK hooks, right? You're familiar with Mustad and Gami and VMC and all of those. Why was the choice to go with a BKK hook? Well, yeah. So for honestly, I think that they're probably like one of the, well, they, so they actually make hooks for, you know, some, some foreign and I think a domestic brand that you'd be surprised about, but uh, so they're like no stranger to it. You can do your homework and look at it. I mean, they're phenomenal. And, you know, you go through the process and you like sample them and you test them and you do what you should do. And you realize that it's like probably the best hook in most cases that, you've ever held and I'll put that right up next to like a Gamakatsu and you know just worked better for that item because where I could source the hooks from and um there were a couple of reasons but mostly just that hook is absolutely perfect and so that jig by the way for 599 the little magnum <laughs> is actually using two hooks so it's a it's a hook assembly fused and molded together and that's what allows us to get the micro line tie so the line tie on that jig is literally a size 2.0 line tie that barely fits 20 pound fluoro through. So literally it is so weedless because the jig, the line just like disappears into the jig. Yeah, there's no hole. <laughs> but the hook is, is basically a 2X, what a lot of people would consider a 2X strong, super short shank, 
um, a flipping hook and it's freaking, it's perfect. Um, but th that's, you know, that's a kind of like a, that was a hard thing to do. That was a lot of experimentation to get right. You know, like that, that honestly, the little Magnum was probably the hardest thing I've ever worked on. Like any, like any, in anything that I've, that I've done like professionally, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that thing was a pain in the, in the ass, but, but yeah, it's, 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 it's a good one. Is that the one you're most proud of? Uh, yeah. I mean, it's funny. I, I think a lot of like people would be like, Oh, but yeah, like genuinely, yeah, like I like, I, honestly, I like all the products. I really do. Um, this football jig that's coming, I'm going to be really, I think is going to be sick. But uh, re the little Magnum is just kind of like a home run, I think, from a lot of different perspectives. Like, I know it's not perfect. I'm sure a lot of guys, maybe guys don't like it and whatever. That's cool. But for what it's, you know, supposed to do and from from like what was supposed to go into it, like it definitely hits all the bases. And, uh, so yeah, I guess, I guess, yeah, it, it's definitely came together perfectly and, uh, it was a nice process. So I'm, I would say, yeah. Well, that sort of wraps us up pretty nicely here. To, that's, that's why we wanted to have this conversation with you, right? You're not, you, you said it earlier and it blows my mind, but it's so true. I just never even thought about it. You don't have a standard, you know, just one off flipping hook, like, you know, or flipping jig, like a lot of people do just your standard, you know, assembly of it because you've tweaked with all this stuff. And that's why we want to have this conversation because you are pushing the envelope. You are, changing you know uh, the, the things that you can change about a jig while it's still being a jig so like with that little magnum the hook the line tie the keeper the weight distribution the material the hook assembly right that's what goes into pushing the envelope on a jig and yeah it may be stuff that the normal person that doesn't fish walks by and they look at two jigs and they look at you know the little magnum and they look at the jig on the the totally. shelf and they're like oh they're the same thing but to us it's not so hats off to you for everything that you've done the last question i have here to wrap us up what's in the future cards you think for beast coast like where is your where are your sights set from here on out yeah i'm just gonna do this honestly there's <laughs> If I, if I could get a million dollars, oh my God, products that we could come out with like immediately. Uh, but in all seriousness, like uh, there's, I, so we're going to, there's going to be a focus on soft baits for a little while and then uh, a wire bait. Um, and that's kind of like the next two years, soft baits and a wire bait, maybe two wire baits um, and another jig. And then that'll really be like it for jigs. Um, but yeah, it's, it's soft baits. We're going to build that out. There's we got some really you know, kind of good stuff um, coming. And then, uh, yeah, the wire baits. And I'd love to get into hard baits. But that's, that's a, something I think I definitely will if I'm still around in like four or five years. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Where can folks find Beast Coast? Where can they keep up with what everything that you guys are doing? Yeah, honestly, just I, follow us on uh, Instagram and pretty soon we'll have a YouTube channel, but not by the time folks hear this, but I mean, we have a YouTube channel, but I would say just, just connect with us on Facebook or Instagram, like, like the rest of the world. And uh, yeah, definitely uh, let us know if, if you like what we're doing. It always, always feels good. That's awesome. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's our conversation with Derek Carr from Beast Coast Fishing. Derek, thanks so much. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. I honestly could keep talking all night, so sorry. <laughs> All right, that is our episode today. Thank you so much, Derek, for stopping by. We are two down, two to go in the Breaking the Mold series here at the Tackle Talk Podcast. Next week, get super excited. We have Ott Defoe. Yes, Mr. Defoe himself, fresh off of the win at MLF Heavy Hitters. He is a Bassmaster Classic champ. He is a legend of the sport, and he's a heck of a lure designer, specifically with crankbaits. So he's got the OG series from Rapala that's out right now that he's working on some new things too. A really cool conversation with someone that you may know as an angler, but you probably don't know too much about him as a lure designer. Until next week, we're going to help you with that. So tune in next week, Ot Defoe on the show for episode three of Breaking the Mold. As always, thank you guys so much. Thank you for all of your support, for subscribing, for leaving reviews on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify. On Spotify, you can leave like five-star reviews. If you want, on Apple Podcasts, you can actually write a review. I read all of them. You guys are great. I can't thank you guys enough, and I'm super excited. We will see you back here next Tuesday for episode three of Breaking the Mold here on the Tackle Talk Podcast. Thank you for listening to the Tackle Talk Podcast. Tackle Talk is produced by Andrew Hayes. Copyright 2021. Please subscribe.
subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. 